Okay, um, today we're going to talk about synthetic substitution, although I have to admit uh, this also this topic also could be called graphing of polynomial functions. The two are closely related. Um, look at this polynomial function, x cubed plus 2x squared minus 5x minus 6. Um, we're going to go ahead and we're going to try to uh, evaluate um, y for given values of x. So we're going to put in different values of x and then we're going to calculate y. Now the old-fashioned way, well first of all let's pick some points. Um, maybe we'll try uh, our x value and our y value. Let's try an x value of 0 and 1 and 2 and then negative 1 and negative 2. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, try, first we'll do this the old-fashioned way. I'd like to evaluate f of negative 2, and we'll do that by plugging negative 2 in here, like such, and then plus 2 times negative 2 squared, and then uh, minus 5 times negative 2, and finally minus 6. <clears throat> now, in a second, I'm going to go ahead and do this calculation, and then I'm going to tell you what f of negative 2 equals. However, I'd like you to pause the video for a moment and see if you can calculate it yourself. So again, negative 2 to the power of 3 plus 2 times negative 2 squared minus 5 times negative 2 minus 6. Pause the video for a moment and see what you get. Then I'm going to try it, and let's see if we agree. Okay, so let's go ahead and do negative 2 cubed. That should get me negative 8. And then uh, negative 2 squared is positive 4 times 2. That's plus 8. And then negative 5 times negative 2 is plus 10. And then minus 6. So these two cancel, so that's 0. 10 minus 6 equals 4. So hopefully you agree with me. Now, if for some reason you did not get f of negative 2 equals 4, that's not that surprising. Um, the, it is, it, it's very easy to make mistakes when evaluating polynomial functions for any given value of x, but especially for a negative number. So we're going to look at a new alternative approach to um, evaluating polynomials for a given number. What we're going to do is we're going to use something called synthetic substitution, which is a lot like synthetic division. We'll take the uh, coefficients from our polynomial, 1 for x cubed, 2 for x squared, and then minus 5 for the x term, and minus 6 for the constant. And then we're going to go ahead and do the same kind of thing we did the other day for synthetic division, except I want to evaluate for uh, x equals negative 2. So what we'll do is we'll put in this box negative 2. Now the other day when we did synthetic division, um, what we would do is we would try to take the opposite, if we had x plus 5, we would take the number that was opposite the 5. That was different, that was synthetic division. For synthetic substitution, we'll just take the x value and put it directly into the box. Now let's go ahead and evaluate like we did with synthetic division. We'll do 1 plus 0 is 1, and then negative 2 times 1 gets us negative 2. 2 plus negative 2 is 0, negative 2 times 0 is 0, negative 5. Negative 5 plus 0 is negative 5. Negative 2 times negative 5 is positive 10. Negative 6 plus 10 gets us 4. So we get the same result, f of negative 2 equals 4. That's the same thing that we got last time uh, when we did it the old-fashioned way. And, uh, and it's a lot easier to do it this way and a lot fewer mistakes. All we're doing is multiplying and adding. Multiplying and adding. It, we're just going to have a lot fewer mistakes if we do things this way. Now let's go ahead and plug in uh, our y value of 4 uh, right next to our x value of negative 2. And let's try calculating a few more of these x values using synthetic substitution. Let's try, um, how about negative 1? Try evaluating that. Again, we use the coefficients of 1, 2, negative 5, negative 6. And we're going to try to go through this quickly. That's the beauty of synthetic substitution. We'll add 1 
to nothing we get 1. Negative 1 times 1 is negative 1. 2 plus negative 1 is 1. Negative 1 times 1 is negative 1. Negative 5 plus negative 1, negative 6. Negative 1 times negative 6, positive 6. Negative 6 plus 6 is 0. So f of negative 1 equals 0. So we'll go ahead and put next to x equals negative 1, we'll put y equals 0. Let's try uh, what if we have 0. So 1, 2, negative 5, negative 6. Uh, hopefully uh, you're following along with me and maybe you're even a little ahead of me because you're thinking, oh, this is pretty easy. 2 plus 0 is 2. 0 times 2 is 0. Negative 5 plus 0 is negative 5. 0 plus negative 5 is, or 0 times negative 5 is 0. Negative 6 plus 0 is negative 6. So f of 0 should be negative 6. And we'll go ahead and put it in the box. Let's try if x is 1. That gets me 1, 2, negative 5, negative 6. So we go 1 plus nothing is 1. 1 times 1 is 1. 2 plus 1 is 3. 1 times 3 is 3, negative 5 plus 3, negative 2, 1 times negative 2, negative 2, negative 6 plus negative 2, negative 8. Remember that every time we do this, we're simply adding from top to bottom. We never subtract, even negative 6 plus negative 2, that's not subtracting. Now, negative 8 is what we get when x is 1. And let's go ahead and let's try, uh, we'll do two. x is 2. So if x is 2, uh, we have 1, 2, negative 5, negative 6. Add 1, we get 1. 2 times 1 is 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. 2 times 4 is 8. 8 plus negative 5, that's 3. 2 times 3 is 6. Negative 6 and 6 is 0. So when x is 2, we get a 0. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to try to plot these points on a graph, and then we're going to use our knowledge of n behaviors of polynomial functions in order to figure out whether we need more points. So let's go ahead and put these points on the graph. Starting with x is negative 2, y is 4. If x is negative 2, y is 4, that's way up here. Let's go ahead and put these points on the graph, starting with x is negative 2. If uh, x is negative 2, y is 4. So x is negative 2, y is 4. Put a big dot on the graph. And then uh, x is negative 1, y is 0. So we'll put a big dot right there. And if x is 0, then y is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, negative 6. Put a big dot right there. And then if x is 1, y is negative 8, so we'll go right down there. And then if x is 2, y is 0. Now, we have several dots on our graph, um, and the, thing, the question we have to ask ourselves is this. Do we need extra dots? And the way we'll answer that question is we'll think about n behavior of uh, polynomial functions. Notice that this guy is a third degree polynomial. There's the, the power of 3 indicates that it's a third degree. That's the highest power of any variable. And also, since, the, since it's third degree, 3 is odd, we'll call this an odd degree polynomial. So we know that there's certain uh, n behavior for odd degree polynomials. Also, let's notice that the coefficient, the leading coefficient, is positive. And that makes a difference, too. So the leading coefficient is positive. So what we usually end up getting is something that looks like this. If we have an odd degree polynomial, just like linear equations, with positive leading coefficients, we'll get a positive sloping line, at least on the ends. So we're kind of expecting that this guy will go up this way forever, and it'll go down this way forever. So we certainly need a few more dots, because from what we have here, it looks almost like maybe it could be a parabola. So maybe we'll try looking at uh, x equals 3 and 4, and x equals negative 3 and negative 4. 
So let's try, we said that we need extra points, so certainly we can look at x equals negative 3 and x equals positive 3. So if x is negative 3, we'll then try 1, 2, negative 5, negative 6, and we can add 1 to nothing, we get 1 negative 3 times 1 is negative 3, 2 and negative 3 is negative 1, negative 3 times negative 1, positive 3, plus negative 5, negative 2, negative 3 times negative 2, positive 6, plus negative 6 gets me 0. So when x is negative 3, y should be 0. And then we also have uh, 3, x equals 3, so let's try that, and we have 1, 2, negative 5, negative 6, and if we add 1 to nothing we get 1, 3 times 1 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 times 5 is 15, plus negative 5 gets us 10, 3 times 10 is 30, plus negative 6 gets us 24. So uh, I'm thinking that we might need one extra point, so I'm going to go ahead and throw an x equals negative 4 in here, and you'll see why in a minute. Uh, and that gets us uh, 1, 2, negative 5, and negative 6. And we have 1, negative 4, negative 2, positive 8, 3, negative 12 and negative 18. I think I think that extra point is going to be helpful. And let's not forget for the positive 3 we'll put in a 24 also. So our new points are 0, 24, and negative 18 for negative 4. Let's go ahead and add those to the graph. Okay, so we've added points x is negative 3, y is 0. And we added pos x is positive 3, y is 24. So if x is positive 3, y is way the heck up there. And by the way, let's remind ourselves this is the x-axis and this is the y-axis, kind of important. Um, and then, and, and take a look, we're trying to figure out whether our graph matches this positive sloping line. And from what I see, it looks like it's possible that it does. Um, certainly if I follow this guy down to here and then up, it looks like we're now going up and we probably will continue to go up forever. Um, this is supposed to be at y is 24. If we tried x is 4, we would probably get a much larger number than 24. Also, you'll notice that I added uh, x equals negative 4 to my list, and then I calculated y equal negative 18. I did that because I could see that, um, that, that there was something happening here, but I didn't know whether we were going to go back up again. Now, I was suspicious we were going to continue down, but I chose the point x equals negative 4 to see for sure. And sure enough, when I put in x is negative 4, I get a point way the heck down here at y equals negative 18. So, um, let's go ahead and try to draw the curve as best we can. And when I do, what I see is I get something that looks like this. This is not my best drawing ever but I get the gist of it. This is my polynomial function, and you'll, you'll notice that it does have n behavior like a positive sloping line. As we go to the right, it goes up forever, and as we go to the left, it goes down forever. But the stuff in between, I got through the benefit of synthetic substitution and plugging in numbers. Now, I want to talk about one more interesting thing that we've seen from this exercise, and it has to do with all these zeros. You may have been wondering what was up with these uh, y values being equal to zero. Well, one thing you might recall from our discussion of quadratic functions is that wherever we have x-intercepts, those guys have several names. We call them x-intercepts, of course. We also call them zeros. Ooh, that could be related to the fact that, uh, we, that we get y equals zero. We also call them roots. And we also have another name, and that other name is uh, solutions. So these guys are known as x-intercepts, but they're also called solutions. 
So it turns out that if we know where the zeros of our function are, then we have a good idea of what kind of function we're going to get, and vice versa. In fact, actually, by, by knowing where these zeros are on the graph, we can actually use these zeros to help factor our quadratic function. So let's take a look and see what we have. We have a 0 at uh, x is negative 3, negative 1, and positive 2. So let's take a look and see what that means. So what's this mean, uh, all of these y values equaling 0? Well, let's try this. Um, we, we say that we have, a, we have zeros at our zeros. They occur at x equals negative 3 and negative 1. And at, uh, at x equals 2. So those are where our zeros is, are. So if that's the case, then it's possible that, well, those are definitely also known as solutions. One of the things that we learned about quadratics is if those guys are zeros, then we might have corresponding factors that could be multiplied together to get those guys. So x plus 1, x plus 3, and x minus 2. If we multiplied these factors together and set them equal to 0, well, then uh, uh, we would get solutions of x equals negative 3, or x equals negative 1, or x equals 2. So it turns out that if we can look at the graph of a polynomial function and figure out where its zeros are, we can work backwards and find out what the polynomial function is. Also, um, if we have a polynomial function and we know where its zeros are, we can use the zeros to determine what are the factors of this polynomial function. And I'll leave it as an exercise for you to try multiplying together x plus 3 times x plus 1 times x minus 2. And I'm kind of curious to see what you get. Just remember that we use the zeros in order to find these factors. And that led us to the factors for this polynomial. That's a pretty handy trick. Duh.